Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's nice to be back. During prayer time, um, I'm thankful because Thursday, yes, Thursday. Thursday, I'm driving with my truck and dump trailer, and I need to go to the office down on uh, Orange Avenue. So I'm driving, and I needed to turn into this parking lot, so I had to actually, to make this turn, swing out and turn. But there's a girl on the moped behind me, who, I don't know what she was thinking, because there's nothing on this side, but she decides she's going to pass me as I'm making this turn. Well, what happens when you turn a truck in a trailer? <laughs> she came by death far from running into my trailer. Oh, wow. Thank God she didn't. Amen. So I'm very thankful for that. Uh, this morning we want to continue on with 1 Peter. We are in chapter 5, the last chapter of his little book. Isn't it funny how it's only five chapters, but I think I've been preaching, preaching on this for two months. <laughs> Feels like it. I told you from the beginning that if there was one book that you were able to keep, one book that you had, that you could read every day that would give you the entire gospel message and everything you needed to know about how to be saved, how to live your life, and how to glorify God, you find it here in 1 Peter. Everything you need. What I love about the epistles is that these guys, whether it's uh, Paul or Peter himself, they spend their early chapters giving you all this information. But if you go to the very last chapter, they wrap all that stuff up and they give you everything that they said prior to that or in that last chapter. Everything in a nutshell. If you want to break down everything Peter told you to do and how you should live, how you should treat each other, how you should interact with your God, it is right here. Actually, it's like right here. Okay? That's easy. That's simple. Most people can memorize all that. You know what I'm saying? So, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1 says, and I love this because he breaks down of who he's talking to. The first people that he's going to address are the elders of the church, the leadership. Okay? And he has very good counsel for them. Now, the Bible tells you that not all of you should aspire to be teachers or preachers because why? Because your judgment will be more intense than others. So if you are a leader, if you are a teacher, make sure you understand what the ramifications of that is. And you stand before these people and you represent God himself. And when you speak, you speak for God. And what you say is recorded. Not just on that thing in the back. But God has it in heaven. And... You do not want to be one of those people who are teaching error and stand before God and have to make an account for that. So understand why you're doing this. Why you feel called to stand before His people and teach them. So Peter has some advice for the teachers. He says, the elders who are among you, I exhort. What does that word mean, exhort? Praise up. He's telling them. Marilyn said he's telling them. But listen, he's telling them. Listen to this. I exhort you. I want you to pay very close attention. I want you to understand what I'm about to tell you. And I want you to remember it. I exhort you. I, Peter, who am a fellow elder, he was a teacher, right? He was a leader in God's church, so he could say, I am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Teachers, that is what we base our hope in. We do not stand up here because we want the admiration of the people. Believe me, you stand up here long enough, you will lose the admiration of people. <laughs> right? Okay? Unless you're 
unless you just tickle the ears all the time. And that's not what we're here for, right? Amen. We as teachers, we know this glory that's going to be revealed. As teachers, you study, right? You prepare. You should have a closer walk with God than the others that sit here in pew. Because you're called to teach. How can you talk about God if you don't know Him? How can you share something you have no experience with? Ray, you preach what you know, right? Ricky, you share the experiences that you know that you have, right? You speak of God's love because you know God's love. Is that right? Amen. And I do the same thing. I can only share with you what I know. What I don't know will leave for somebody else. Right? So this glory that is going to be revealed is that Christ will work in you teachers, in you preachers, and that through you, He will use you to instruct, to guide, to uplift His people. God has called you for something that the most prestigious office in this world can't even compare to. Amen. You could be the President of the United States. And we have one, whether you like him or whether you don't. He has power. He has prestige. And wherever he goes, people listen to what he says. <coughs> right? In my lifetime, I've been through four or five presidents. Some of you have been through more than that, right? Maybe even more than that. Or six. There's a time when I don't remember presents or what they did. That's too young. But in my memory. And I've heard what they said. Some of it I liked and a lot of it I didn't like. But when you speak for God, and you stand before however large or small your congregation is, and when you share what God has put in your heart, the words you speak are more powerful, more worthy, than any words that ever come out of the president's mouth. Amen. This is his advice for you guys. Shepherd the flock of God. Ray, what does that mean to you to shepherd the flock of God? It means keep, protect, and cherish. Ricky, what does it mean to you? Shepherd the flock of God. Yep. Guide. 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 Appreciate. I like that. Appreciate. Ray, what did you say? To keep, cherish, and protect. Keep, cherish, and protect. This is what God has called us for. Listen, why does the Bible say that you should respect your elders? And this is the elder that's talking. About. Listen to what they say. Submit to the elders of the church. Why does it say that? Because you guys have no idea the kind of responsibility that the leaders of this church have. And if you think Satan works hard in your life, if you can get the leader, fall like dominoes. This is why you need to, as the congregation, support the leadership that you have. Raise your hand, anybody that gets paid for what office they hold in the church. Okay, so you're talking a bunch of volunteers. Why do they do it? Wait, why do you spend all this time working here? I, I couldn't imagine doing anything else. Here's, here's a good one. Lynn! Hello! Oh, yeah, there you go. I saw you yesterday. Donald? Where's he at? There you go. Edna? You ever see these guys on Friday? When they pick up all that food? Little Ray. Little Ray? Yeah. Gary and Janet? Marty. Marty? Then they bring the food back here? And that's where the fun really begins. I get to walk in when they're doing all that stuff. <coughs> Why do you do it? You get paid for that? No, we love it. Then after they sort all that food and they put it in boxes and everybody has their name on their box, then the people come and they get those boxes. And after they give out the boxes, then they have to clean all this stuff up. Edna, why do you do it? You enjoy helping people out? Yes. Yeah. 
that is what Christianity is supposed to be about. That is how the world sees Jesus in us. Amen. When I see these people week after week, or every other week, working this hard to feed people they might not even know, and yet they're faithful in their duties. Lynn, I look and I say, why do you keep doing this? But I know why. Because you know the Master. And you're not doing it for yourself, is that right? You're doing it because that's what Jesus would do. And that's what Jesus has called you to do, right? Shepherd the flock of God. We are here to serve, not to be served, not to be looked upon with adoration, not to be put in a place where we shouldn't be put. We are here to feed you. We are here to bring Christ to you, to hopefully make the Bible come alive with our singing, with our teaching, with our preaching. But listen, if that's not happening, that's not all my fault. <laughs> if you don't get anything out of the sermon, that's not all my fault. If you're not coming here prepared before I start, that's your fault. Because if the Word of God is being talked about, and it can be the driest speaker you've ever heard, you should be able to get something. Why? Because it's not the speaker, it's the Word of God of God. Amen. Amen. If you just want to be entertained, there are a thousand other churches that would do that for you. Is that what your job is, right? No. Ricky, is that your job? No. To entertain me? No. Deborah, is that your job? No. That's not my job either. You do your part. You prepare your heart when you come in here. You prepare throughout the week. Yeah. I prepare throughout the week. You prepare throughout the week. To hear a message that is from God Himself. Not from me, not from Ray, not from Deborah, not from Ricky. From God Himself. And if you do that, God will bless you. Amen. God will feed you. And God will strengthen you. Thank you, Jesus. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers. What does that mean, overseer? Okay, what does that mean? <laughs> what did you say, Martin? Protector. A protector. Okay, that's a good word as an overseer. Now, all of us have at one time or another had a boss. Supervisor. Supervisor. Super meaning over, visor meaning seer. Okay. What's the difference between this kind of supervisor and the supervisor you may have at work? End goal, the direction. End goal, the direction. One's forced and one's not. Oh, I love that. That's what I was listening for. Say it again. One's forced and one's not. All right. All of you guys, you come here because you choose to come here. Nobody's forcing you, correct? Well, is there any children here today? <laughs> one. The vast majority of you come here out of your own free will. You choose to come here. You want to be here, right? And so the overseers of the flock need to understand that, that we are not here to lord this over you. You are not here to serve us. We are here to serve you. We are here to meet your needs. We are here to bring Jesus to you. And if you allow us to do that, then you are bringing Jesus to us, right? Amen. Now, have you ever had a pastor that was more of a tyrant than a overseer yes. here in a biblical sense? Yes. And how well did you like working under a dictator? Okay, those of you who volunteer and you actually have a position here in church, and you know that it's taking your time, your resources, and in the process of doing it, it takes you away from other things in your life, and you're not getting paid for it. Do you want somebody lording that over you? 
Do you want to work under a dictator? Or do you want to work under somebody who really cares for your heart, for your soul, and for your well-being? That's what the leadership of the church is supposed to be. That's what an overseer here is. That we do this because we care about you. Now, I understand the full meaning of that. Ray, you care enough about me to tell me the bad things about me, right? Absolutely. You, Ricky, you care, you care enough about me to tell me when I have overstepped my bounds yes. and I have made a mistake, right? If you don't like hearing bad things, don't come back. Because if you stay here long enough, you will hear bad things. Because that's part of our job. Right? How many of you are sinless? Raise your hand. Sinless. See? It's unanimous. Nobody is raising their hand. So all of us have this sin problem. Right? And so if I as the leader have that, and the other leaders have that, and everybody sitting in the congregation has that, then what hope is there for us? There is therefore now no condemnation. Romans 8, 1. Very well said. The hope is in Jesus Christ. Right? Jesus Christ is what motivates Ricky, Ray, and every other leader here to continue to do what we do in ministry. It is because Jesus has done something for me, and I know Jesus yes. can do the same for you. Amen. And what you share with me that Jesus has done for you just reinforces in me when I have a really bad day and I'm wondering where God is. But He still loves me. Amen. 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 Gentlemen, that's what we're here for. Ladies, that is what we're here for. Never forget that. There are so many things that happen in this life. Kyla, I see your hand, so just hold on. So many things that happen in this life. There is so much dissension, confusion, just stuff. Your position as a leader does not give you the right to bring in your own opinions of where you think this church should go or what you think this church should do. What your job is, is to teach Jesus Christ and to lift him up and to bring the people to the cross. Amen? Amen. Amen. Politics, the color of the pews, how we and what we eat at our potlucks. <coughs> individually, if there is a problem can be discussed with the leadership if there is a problem. But the leaders to preach on those things because that's their pet peeve may not be the best idea. Right? Yeah. Everything that you talk about, everything that you teach in your Sabbath school class, everything that you sing, if it's not Christ-centered, then you really got to ask yourself, why am I actually teaching this? Why am I <coughs> singing this? Why am I preaching this? Right? Christ and Him crucified. Kyle. You were talking about um, um, leadership. Yes. It's like mom, um, no driving. Uh -huh. She has a boss that, uh -huh. that, um, Tells her what um, to do. Right. He is her leader. Mm -hmm. Boy has a boss at um, um his work. Right. to use their power and authority and knew how to 
get their team, the people that work underneath them, to work together as a team. And we've had bosses who uh, use the, the conquer and divide uh, idea of, of let's just keep some type of uh, drama going on. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, and, and we pray on the weak ones, and the weak ones will tell me everything that's going on. Okay? There's not much difference sometimes in churches. We use those same ideas. And that's not what we're called for as leaders. Okay? So listen, shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, but not by, what's that word? Compulsion. What's that word compulsion mean? Force. Force. What's that? Because you have to. When Jesus dealt, now listen, can you imagine having 12 people on your workforce, like the disciples, when Jesus first called them? And for three years you're working with these guys, and you come to the end of the line, and these guys still don't get it. You're walking down the street and they're arguing amongst themselves, who's still going to be the greatest? Did Jesus ever use compulsion no. to get those guys in line? No. no. Overseas of the flock, that's how we need to treat the flock. Not by compulsion, but willingly. Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. We do this because we do it for Christ. Okay? Not as lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. This is one of the hardest things about being a leader, and that is your place up there as an example. Most of the time, as leaders, we can put on a good front because you're not with us every day. You see us one, two times a week, right? And we make sure we put on our best behavior here, right? But now, if your spouse was to get up here and start to really let the people know what it's like living with you 24-7. Uh-oh. <laughs> <right? laughs> what that should do, leaders, is drive you to your knees, right? And as Ray pointed out with the example of Peter himself. And I'm glad he did that because I want you to think. And I want you to get a picture in your head of what Peter was like prior to the crucifixion. And that's pretty much what Ray is talking about. Right? That Peter. The impulsive guy. That one minute man he was saying the right thing. Jesus was telling him he said the right thing. Next minute, the word's coming out of his mouth. Jesus is saying, Satan, get behind me. Okay? That's not this Peter. You guys understand that? Yeah. He's a totally different guy here. This is the converted dude. This is the Peter that fully submitted to Christ. Right? Who gave up wanting to be the man. And realized that Jesus is... The man. Right. And that the best I can do is just submit myself to him on a day to day basis. And if I do that, then Jesus will do marvelous things with me, in me, and through me. Yeah. Right? You look at all those mistakes that Peter made during the course of Jesus' ministry, but then you look at the Peter that wrote first and second Peter. The Peter that was able in the book of Acts to walk down the street and if his shadow came across a sick person, it healed them. And Peter wasn't tapping himself on the shoulder going, look at what I did. When he was brought before the Sanhedrin, he said, why do you look at me? I have nothing. This isn't my power. This is the power of Jesus Christ. This isn't just for leaders, this is for everybody. This is what and where we need to be. To understand and know him so well that it's no longer you or me up here hoping that what I say 
uh, makes an effect on something. But it's actually submitting to God and letting His words speak. Letting His Spirit move. And realizing that when I'm done, I'm done. It's over with. He must increase. And we must decrease. Not as lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Ricky, what is it that you want from God? You. Good answer. Ray, what is it that you want from God? When, when, you, first, when you first see Jesus face to face, what do you want to hear? What do you want? To hear him say, that he doesn't have to say anything. I just want to see him smile. I want to oh, see how to look into his eyes and him be pleased. Now, how about you? Hold on, I'll put the table, sir. I mean, you're on the same page. Approval. That is what I want to live my life for. That is my hope. And the thing that drives me is I want to be able to hear him say, Well done. Good of you. And Ray. I want to look into his eyes and I want to get a hug from him. Can you imagine God hugging you? How many of you like hugs? Raise your hand. There's nobody here that doesn't like them. Can you imagine God hugging you? That kind of embrace? Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to the older people. Why? Why should the young submit themselves to their elders? <laughs> Do you hear what she said? So you don't have to read.